At the age of 34, Debbie Elizabeth Griggs was a former nurse and mother of three young sons and was four months pregnant. She was married to Andrew Griggs, living on Cross Road in Deal, Kent, a coastal town in England. On May 5, 1999, she strangely disappeared from home in the middle of the night. Her husband claimed to be sleeping when his wife left home, and he reported her missing about 24 hours later. Andrew told the dispatcher that she suffered from depression and had taken $250 and her car and said he couldn't recall the license plate number. A large search was launched, with detectives saying how unusual it was that Debbie would choose to walk out on her three young sons. Also strange was the fact that Andrew claimed he couldn't provide police with a recent photo of his wife of nearly 10 years. Yet, he also appeared calm despite Debbie missing for over a day. Soon after, her car was found abandoned a mile from her home with the trunk lining and carpet oddly missing and a smear of her blood was found on the inside. After her disappearance, her bank account sat dormant and she never used any health services or social security. When she disappeared, Andrew and Debbie were running the Griggs Freezer Center in South Street Deal. However, just days before Debbie vanished, Andrew set up their joint business bank account in his name only. Once the investigation came to a halt in mid-2001, Andrew moved to St. Leonard's, Dorset, England, and started over with a new job and a new wife. He would marry a woman also named Debbie, who largely resembled his missing first wife. When investigators took a look at Debbie's diary, they saw numerous entries detailing the bullying she suffered at the hands of Andrew. Although she had said her husband had never been physically abusive, she described him as a bombastic and bullying man. For example, she wrote, He does not let me go out by myself. His needs come first. He tells me I am sick and mad in the head. Debbie's three sons never gave up hope of finding their mother, and Andrew remained a prime suspect for the next two decades. Twenty years later, Andrew was finally arrested for Debbie's murder and put on trial. On October 19, 2019, Andrew was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison for the murder of Debbie and their unborn child. During the trial, a woman now in her 30s, who he was accused of grooming at the age of 15 years old, testified against him. It turns out that before Debbie went missing, she had just learned of Andrew's affair with the teenage girl, and she refused to cover it up for him. He likely feared she would get half the family freezer business if she divorced him. He had also mentioned to friends that he wished his wife was dead. The judge believed that because he was a fisherman, he likely dumped her remains in the nearby sea. In 2020, the former couple's three children launched a social media page called Find Our Mom. Finally, in October 2022, after receiving a tip, it was discovered that he had not actually dumped her remains in the nearby sea, but instead buried them under the patio in the back garden of a house in St. Leonard's, Dorset, England, 170 miles away. This is where he moved to a couple of years after she went missing. It's unclear where he kept her remains during those two years and how he killed her, but investigators believe he took her with him when he moved. The couple's three sons, and eventually Andrew's second wife, lived at the home too, unaware that Debbie was buried under the patio. Her sons even played in the back garden for years, unaware their mother was buried beneath them. 23 years after she was killed, she was finally laid to rest with a proper burial, and the monster that took her life remains behind bars. Rita Patricia Curran was born in 1947 in Brooklyn, New York. In 1971, 24-year-old Rita moved out of her parents' home for the first time to live with three other roommates that she didn't know very well. She and her roommate's apartment was located at 17 Brooks Avenue in Burlington, Vermont. She was a beloved teacher at Milton Elementary School and spent the summer working as a maid at a local motel and taking graduate courses at the University of Vermont. 
In the early morning hours of July 20, 1971, Rita's roommate tragically arrived home to find her deceased body in the bedroom that they shared. She had been sexually assaulted, beaten, and then strangled to death. It was evident that she fought hard for her life and still had curlers in her hair when she was found. Unfortunately, the case would go unsolved for almost 50 years. In 2019, authorities reopened the case and started fresh from the beginning. A key piece of evidence was a lark cigarette butt found next to her arm. In 2014, previous investigators had sent the butt and other evidence off for DNA analysis. A male's DNA was detected on the cigarette butt in testing, but it didn't match any suspects in the DNA database. It also didn't match the known DNA of the police's 13 main suspects. In 2022, more evidence, including Rita's clothes, was sent to a lab in Florida where they performed new DNA extracting techniques. In addition, her house coat was tested and the killer's DNA was also found on it. Meanwhile, detectives sent the genetic evidence from the cigarette butt to a genealogy company to see if a bigger database of DNA could help them find the killer, and lo and behold, it did. On February 21, 2023, 52 years after the murder, the Burlington Police Department announced they had identified the man as William DeRoos, who was 31 at the time and lived in an apartment two stories up from Rita with his wife, Michelle. After fighting with his wife of only two weeks, he left his apartment that night to cool down. The next day, he told Michelle not to mention to the police that he had not been home at the time of the murder because they would try to accuse him of it because of his criminal history. When detectives questioned the couple, they said they hadn't seen or heard anything that night. Detective Thomas Shinnett, who interviewed Michelle decades later, said he didn't believe she knew William had actually murdered Rita that night and was only protecting him because of his criminal record. When they re-interviewed Michelle, she told them he had left their apartment for over an hour when Rita's roommates were out. After killing Rita, William moved to Thailand and became a Buddhist monk. He and Michelle divorced while he was there, and he returned to the United States in 1974, where he met his second wife, Sarah Hepting. In 1986, he died of a drug overdose at the age of 46 in a San Francisco hotel room. Burlington detectives later interviewed a subsequent wife who told them William often had sudden outbursts of violence. She also said that she once witnessed him stab a female friend in her stomach for no reason at all. William later told his wife that he thought it was her that he stabbed. In addition, she said that William strangled her unconscious once for no apparent reason at all. Julie Fuller was born on May 22, 1972, in Essex, England. At the age of 11, her parents, Janet and Colin Fuller, and brother Lee had just moved from England to Arlington, Texas. They were living in what was then known as the Kensington Motel on West Division. On June 27, 1983, Julie walked out of the hotel room to take out the trash and then disappeared and was never seen alive again. The next day, construction workers found her nude body along the bank of a river in Fort Worth along the 200 block of Hanley and Etterville Road. She'd been strangled and sexually assaulted. Her family, unable to handle the stress of her murder, returned to the UK. 35 years later, in 2018, using the DNA collected from the crime scene in 1983, Parabon Nanolabs was able to create a DNA snapshot of the suspect. His DNA was then used for genetic genealogy research, leading investigators to relatives of the killer who had entered their DNA into open source databases. The police then contacted the family members of their suspect and requested additional DNA samples. Finally, the suspect was identified as James Francis McNichols, but unfortunately, he would never face justice because he died in 2004 in Iowa at the age of 52. He was a Vietnam vet who lived in the Fort Worth area 
around the time of the murder. While he had a criminal past, he was never on the FBI's radar, and his DNA was never in a database. Julie's brother, Lee, said it was bittersweet to see the face of the man who took his sister's life. This was the first time Fort Worth police have been able to use this sort of genetic testing to solve a crime. Gerald Martin was born on July 11, 1941, and went by the nickname Jerry. Jerry was one of five children living with his father in an apartment at 725 11th Avenue near 51st Street in the Hell's Kitchen neighborhood of New York City. In the late afternoon of July 9, 1945, little Jerry, just two days shy of his fourth birthday, and his six-year-old brother Tom were riding their bikes near their apartment. Suddenly, a woman they didn't know approached them and asked the boys if they wanted some candy. Tom said no, but little Jerry said yes, and so the woman took him by the hand and told Tom they would be right back after getting candy. Tom waited with their bicycles, but sadly, Jerry never came back. Tom rushed home and told his father, Harold, and a neighborhood search ensued. Unable to find little Jerry, Harold reported him missing. Since Harold and his wife Nancy were separated and Tom and Jerry were living with him, suspicion immediately surrounded Nancy. Harold went to the police with this theory, and a newspaper article quickly went out the next day with Nancy and Jerry's descriptions, but eventually the police were able to rule her out. Sadly, decades passed with no sign of Jerry, which really took a toll on his father, who was often seen crying. On his deathbed, Harold insisted Jerry was still alive, saying that he felt it in his heart. After Harold and Nancy perished, Tom continued the search for his brother. Amazingly, more than 70 years later, Tom was about to get some much-needed answers. One day, Audrey Bell, a mother to triplets in Long Island, New York, ordered 23andMe DNA tests for her triplet daughters to determine which were the identical siblings and which was the fraternal sibling. When she received the results weeks later, she found her answer, but also found out they strangely had no Italian ancestry. This was confusing because Audrey and her twin sister, Cynthia, and their younger sister were raised to believe they were of Italian descent. In fact, their father, Richard Palmadesso, had always been very proud of his Italian heritage. In 2019, Cynthia and their younger sister, Stephanie, took their own DNA ancestry test, and it showed the same results. Neither of them had any Italian ancestry. Like Audrey's results, it showed they had Irish, Scottish, and Spanish ancestry. Sadly, their father, Richard, passed away in 2017, and his parents were deceased as well. So the sisters reach out to their father's first cousin, who was also named Richard Palmadesso. They asked him to take a DNA test, but he already knew the family secret the sisters were about to learn. So he wasn't shocked when his results confirmed that the sisters weren't related to the Palmadesso family. He also claimed that the entire Palmadesso family knew that their father wasn't a blood relative and that he was the only person unaware of his true identity. Cynthia and Audrey both decided to turn on their DNA connections with 23andMe, and lo and behold, it matched with Tom. The DNA match was 22%, which meant that Tom was their grandfather or uncle. They reached out to Tom and quickly learned that Richard Palmadesso was actually Jerry Martin. It turned out that in 1945, the year Jerry was kidnapped, Angelo Palmadesso was serving in World War II while his wife, Isabel, remained home in Long Island. Isabel was in her 40s, and although she had one or two grown daughters from a previous relationship, she didn't have any children with Angelo. It's speculated that she could have become pregnant before Angelo went off to war and miscarried, or that she wanted to produce a child for him when he returned home from war. With the surrender of the Nazis on May 7, 1945, Angelo's return was inevitable, so it is likely that Isabel realized she needed to quickly produce a two-year-old son before he arrived home. Isabel doctored a fake birth certificate, 
which listed his birthplace as Staten Island with the date of birth of March 31, 1943, born to parents Isabel and Angelo Palmadeso. After Jerry was kidnapped, she told him that he was two years old and his name was Richard. When Jerry was 12, Isabel perished and Angelo sent him off to live with his uncle Giacomo and his cousin also named Richard Palmadeso. As an adult, Jerry didn't keep in touch with his father, the uncle who helped raise him, or his cousins, and he rarely spoke about them. He did, however, stay in touch with the woman who'd been his nanny, Helen Morgan. Later in life, Helen even lived with Richard, his wife, and the twins. She died when Audrey and Cynthia were 10 years old, but it was rumored at the time that Helen was Richard's biological mother. The family assumed he had been taken in because Helen was a single mother. Angelo likely found out that Jerry was not his biological son at some point, or he knew the truth all along. Unfortunately, it was common during this era for children to be taken off the streets or even from hospitals after birth to be raised by the women who stole them as their own. Richard told the sisters that their father was treated like an outcast as a child, and as a result, Jerry became an anxious child and remained that way into adulthood. When he finished school and moved away, none of his relatives attempted to stay in touch, including Angelo, who passed away when Jerry was 26. This lined up since Jerry had always told his daughters that he never felt like he belonged, nor did he have anything in common with his family. When law enforcement looked into it, they couldn't find the missing persons file on Jerry. The family was told it might have been destroyed in a fire at the precinct. The New York Daily News article was one of only a few pieces of evidence the twins could find that revealed any details of the kidnapping. The sisters said that while their father was quiet and anxious, he was also kind, funny, and silly. Ironically, he always dreamed of being an actor, but never actually acted in anything. Same as his brother Tom, who had headshots taken of him when he was younger with hopes of entering the world of acting. The sisters say it makes sense now why there was always a disconnect between their father and his family. After exchanging photos, they discovered that Tom and Richard looked strikingly similar. Although Tom never got a chance to reunite with his long-lost brother, he was overjoyed that after 74 years, he finally had closure and gained three new family members. The sisters soon met with their uncle Tom, and since Tom didn't have any children of his own, the sisters sent him a present each Father's Day to remind him that although he lost his brother, he would always have them. Christina Lynn Castiglione was born on March 8, 1964. In 1983, at the age of 19, Christina was living with her parents in Redford, Michigan, had a steady boyfriend, and was working as a clerk at the Detroit Edison Company in the research department. On the night of March 19, 1983, Christina's boyfriend and some of his friends were on their way to a party around 8 p.m., when they spotted Christina walking on Five Mile Road near Beach Daily Road. Her father had taken her car away and she had resorted to hitchhiking. When her boyfriend passed her, he stopped a few blocks away at a party store to wait for her, but she never showed up. So they turned around and went looking for her but couldn't find her. Sadly, she was never seen alive again and her mother reported her missing. Over a week later, her body was located near Fisher and Fawcett Roads in the Oak Grove State Game Area in Deerfield Township. She was partially clothed in a remote, wooded area and had tragically been sexually assaulted and strangled to death. Her body was found when the snow started melting after a heavy snowfall. During the autopsy, the medical examiner located male DNA that was collected and preserved. Despite potential leads, the case would go cold for 40 years. Finally, in March of 2022, a grant was provided by Season of Justice, a nonprofit organization dedicated to providing funding for investigative agencies and families to help solve cold cases. 
The DNA was then sent to Othram to conduct advanced DNA testing on the DNA samples taken in 1983. A comprehensive genealogical profile of the male suspect was developed and used for genetic genealogy. This led to the identification of a suspect by the name of Charles David Shaw. However, they would never be able to arrest Shaw because six months after Christina's murder, he died of an accidental self-sexual asphyxiation. Detectives were unable to find any direct ties between Christina and Charles Shaw to suggest why she was targeted but it was determined that he was a longtime Lavanya resident who lived less than five miles from where Christina went missing. Based on information from Shaw's family, he was described as a sex addict with a disturbing life who struggled with mental illness. He also had several interactions with law enforcement beginning at a young age, and his first contact with police was in 1973 for a breaking and entering complaint in Lavanya. He was arrested by Livonia police in 1977 for drug possession and was also arrested in 1981 for the attempted abduction of a woman in the Fowlerville McDonald's parking lot. The cooperation of the Shaw family during the investigation was very helpful to authorities in solving the case. Thankfully, after 40 years, Christina's surviving family can now have some long-awaited closure.